Thank you for joining our CCS Fundraising, AI and Fundraising webinar today. I'm Greg Hagan, Principal and Managing Director at CCS. I oversee our data analytics and AI, as well as systems and change management practice groups. I also lead our Philadelphia, Toronto, and Sydney offices and advise a number of national and global partnerships. For the main topic today, it is clear to us at CCS that there's a massive interest in the future of fundraising, technology in fundraising, and of course, AI in fundraising. We are experiencing an incredible shift, a set of changes and waves, arguably like never before. Every day, it seems there's a new capability or possibility or company that is sprouting up from this stage. Just last week, Nobel Prizes were awarded to two or three computer scientists in the fields of biology and chemistry related to neural networks. So questions all around us, will AI solve our greatest challenges or supercharge them? We're asking ourselves if this moment is one of promise or peril. Favorable influence or useless information, is AI a positive or negative tool? or a helpful or harmful agent? So some of these questions are philosophical naturally, they're fun, maybe even frightening. We will say for the purposes of this webinar for today, we take a decidedly bullish outlook on AI and fundraising while acknowledging that there are inherent risks and concerns to recognize. What we really want to do in today's webinar is drive into and dive right into the strategic considerations and practical applications of AI and fundraising. So we're looking to explore and engage around questions along the likes of, for example, what donor journeys would we like to curate? What does a donor lifetime journey look like? What stories do we wish we could tell with our data now that we cannot today? That's a shout out to my friend and colleague, Allison Wilner, who leads our systems and change management practice. Also, what experiments would we like to run? How are we thinking about this AI and fundraising frame in terms of crawl, walk, run, and hopefully fly? So our roadmap for today, when we take a look at our agenda, is to really open up with my friend and colleague, Dr. Ashutosh Nandeshwar, our CCS head of data science. Ashutosh will look to give us a summary view of our CCS paper, AI and Fundraising, and we will then be joined by our esteemed panel of leaders and experts in the field who are practicing really at the highest levels of the industry. And then, of course, we'll open for Q&A from some of the comments and questions that can be submitted. The only other thing I would like to add as we get going here is Really a reminder from my academic advisor, Ethan Mollick, who's a Wharton professor and author of Co-Intelligence. And he summarized many of this and said, look, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect of that technology in the long run. So with all that said, Ashutosh, over to you. Thank you, Greg. My name is Ashutosh Nandeshwar. It's nice to be here with everybody. Uh, I oversee CCSS data science and analytics practice area. With my background, as Greg mentioned, in machine learning, I have built uh, large data science teams across different sectors and organizations. And I really enjoy breaking down complex problems into small, actionable insights and data products. Today, I'm really excited to hear from our distinguished panelists of Jeff, Craig, Lindsay, and David, we'll, we will hear from them soon. But before we do so, uh, you would in the next five minutes or so, you will learn about the different types of AI, the history of AI, how AI can help, and what are some of those considerations that Greg uh, mentioned earlier. So let's spend maybe five minutes in that and go through the history of AI. What does that mean? And how does that actually uh, apply today? And one of the things that we have heard from different nonprofit leaders is some of the challenges that nonprofits face are, are they are just overwhelmed by lots of data. And they sometimes struggle with organizing uh, and making sense of all that data. And they sometimes don't know what to do with all that data. So with the generative AI, the technology has been so accessible and democratized that 
uh, people want to experiment by themselves. But then, because there are no guardrails, sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. Without with 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 and without the AI policies, the employees sometimes don't know what exactly can be done and what should they be doing and how should they safeguard their data. Sometimes leaders also are challenged with what type of AI tools that they have available or what can be done with those tools and what cannot be done with those tools. But then also sometimes a lack of understanding or sometimes feeling that they are left behind with all this advancement that Greg again mentioned earlier on the call, they sometimes struggle to get started. So in, again, in the next minute or so, we will get a glimpse of so that it can actually help shed some light into some of those issues, but then also provide a guideline or some sort of roadmap how these tools can be used and how we can get started uh, in some of these with, with some of these tools. So it's critical to also think about how far we have come along. So you see on your screen right now the, the timeline for AI. When we think about AI, our minds are usually filled with robots, androids, uh, walking around. But actually, the, the, the field of AI started with very simple mathematical representations of computer problems. Uh, so Alan Turing first broke the enigma with his mathematical genius. But then he also posed this Turing test. Can computers be become so smart that humans aren't able to tell who they are talking to? And that was the Turing test, which held uh, really strong for many, many decades to uh, always prove this test, whether this AI is working or not. And I think with the large language models, we feel that finally Turing test is actually, uh, we are able to pass that. And maybe now we need to set up some new guidelines to test whether we can, are still making advancement in AI. But after the 1950s, the initial excitement around how computers can aid our, our thinking, our analysis, our reasoning, scientists first built these expert systems, which were in essentially catalog of our knowledge and formulating those into if and then statements. So if this happens, then this that happens. So it was very helpful in accounting on knowledge economies, but the, the promise that the systems were making actually did not come to fruition. But in the 1980s, as Greg mentioned, the, the Nobel Prize winning experts, Hopfield, Hinton, and others started building on this neural network concept, which is a representation of how our neurons work in our brain and how they pass the electric signals and how we decode information. They were, again, mathematical representations. They were not necessarily trying to replicate how our brain works, but they were mathematical representations of those. And again, lots of excitement with this new technology. Um, people thought that this could solve lots of deep problems. But the challenge back then was our computing power. And as you see this timeline, one of the biggest things that you will notice in this timeline is the computing power that we have accumulated. And that's really uh, the Morse law that the semiconductors are doubling in its size and they're also becoming cheaper. And also the available data that we have digitized has also grown. So with that, the although we faced the first AI winter because the neural networks did not show the promise that they were uh, people were hoping from, but in early 2000s, when the, the neural networks became themselves very complicated, rather than having only one hidden layer or very few neurons, there were thousands and thousands of layers and millions of nodes that they were interconnected, which were uh, capable of understanding lots and lots of information and lots of inf uh, data. And because of that, we saw in early 2000s, uh, how AlphaGo was able to beat uh, Go, a Go participant, IBM's Watson beat a human contestant in Jeopardy. But then also in early 2000s, this deep learning, which is again, multiple layers of network, we saw huge impacts in the computer vision area as well. And the autonomous vehicle research also got impacted. And then obviously now we know how these large language models came about and how again, these deep learning models were able to comprehend huge corpus of data or text and able to predict uh, next sentences, next words. And we will see on the next slide also how this timeline actually breaks down neatly into two categories. We like to call them uh, traditional AI and modern or generative AI. So traditional AI, most of the world runs on traditional AI. According to some numbers or some estimates, Amazon 70% of revenue is generated through the recommendation engine. So when you are on the website, when it says 
based on your history, you may also like these items. Are machine learning helping to classify? So for example, if you make a credit card transaction and your credit card company calls you uh, that there might be a fraud detection, that's machine learning helping. And then also separating all these different objects using machine learning, where, whether it's a cat or a dog in, a, in a, a video, that's also based on machine learning. But then when we think about generative AI or modern AI, this is where we can use natural language or just simple English-based prompts to create content, to create videos, to create images, and so on and so forth. And that's where all this excitement is coming from because to use the traditional AI tools, you really have to know programming. You have to know some of these uh, specialized tools and applications to get the desired output. But with modern generative AI, you essentially can just feed those prompts and get the output that you desire. Well, now we saw a little bit of a glimpse of what AI means, where it has come from, how progress we have made. The, the question you might be asking is, okay, so why should I be using AI in fundraising context? Well, there are lots of ways how you can think about it. A couple of big uh, ways to see this is efficiency gains, cost savings, productivity gains, but then also increased revenue. Automated processes along with predictive AI or generative AI can help us acquire more donors, upgrade donors, retain donors. They can also help predict the likelihood of future donations. So we can optimize our annual giving programs, our major giving programs, and we can tailor communication accordingly. But then you can also think about the, the generative AI applications where we can create chatbots, interactive chatbots. So rather than uh, the visitors to the website struggling with which areas to give, maybe they can chat with these chatbots and really learn about what the, the organization is doing and then align their giving accordingly. And then chat GPT, Claude, and Copilot and tools like those can help create lots of business development material, qualification email, acknowledgement letters, and, and so on and so forth. So the applications are limitless, but then obviously there are again challenges as we will see on the next slide. Is how should we get started? Should we think about building something really big? Should we, as Greg mentioned, the start, uh, the, the crawl, walk, run framework? Or should I have a grand three-year, five-year plan and start making progress? Where should we really go? We typically recommend that you should start really small because the, the, the danger of not starting is actually higher because then you don't know necessarily all the limitations or the capabilities or the capacity these different tools have. So we always recommend that you should start small even if it is not uh, maybe solving a critical problem just right now, but it also is helping you understand what the limitations of the technology are. But then where, as you start making progress, once you have more familiarity with these different tools and applications, you can establish goals and, uh, and, uh, and estimate what you want to uh, achieve from these applications and these processes. And then accordingly, you can build the necessary infrastructure required and skills. And you continuously monitor and seek support from experts or within your organization and also plan the budgets for all of those things. But then again, this crawl, walk, run, fly, and fly eventually framework, starting small uh, is our recommendation. But there are some considerations also as you think about the possibilities and as Greg mentioned, the perils also. One of the two of the biggest ones are ethics and privacy. Should we be doing this? Are, have our donors given the permission to use their data to do some of these things? The privacy concerns are when you are uploading your data to some of these open models, what's the risk? Your data is being, uh, being leaked. Maybe some of these uh, models will train on uh, your data. Do we really want that? Accuracy is a big concern for sure. Uh, so I, uh, there is a saying in statistics that all models are wrong. Some, are, some of them are useful. It applies to predictive AI as well as generative AI. In predictive AI, although it's directional, there might it still might make mistakes because you're not going to get 100% accuracy. So what does that mean when you are giving those leads or prospects to your gift officers? How do you balance that? When you think about generative AI, uh, there is a euphemism called hallucinations is actually really making stuff up. For example, when I asked one of these models uh, who Ashutosh Nandeshwar is, it first said that I am a TED TED Talk speaker, a climate change expert. And I got really excited thinking, oh, there's someone like me. 
But then when I asked and said, okay, this person doesn't, uh, I don't see this person, it replied and said, this Ashutosh Nandeshwar actually doesn't exist at all, which was a blow to my existential uh, kind of uh, feelings and thinking. But definitely think about accuracy. And then talent, how do you acquire the talent that re is required to get some of these initiatives off the ground? Should we be retaining? Should we be upgrading? Should we be trying to outsource? Those are some of the considerations. And I'm really pleased to invite our panel to talk about some of these considerations and AI applications. So would love, like to invite Greg uh, back to uh, lead this discussion. That's great. Thanks so much, Ashu. And chat GPT or any one of those more accurate predictors. I don't know, Ashu, they're onto something. Maybe they're future forecasters of where you're going with the TED Talks and the climate science and the like. But really appreciate that summary view. Everything from considerations, implementation, the history, the theory of AI, and where we are now in most practical use to increase revenue, reduce costs, and uh, experiment really with automation and, and other considerations. So we're very excited about our panel discussion here. Uh, Jeff, Craig, Lindsay, and David, thank you again so much for uh, lending your expertise, your insights, and your practical examples and, and perspectives on behalf of your institutions and your own leadership styles and priorities. So why don't we get a quick round of intros? And Jeff, perhaps I can start with you. Same question to everyone. As a fun fact, as you're introducing yourself, maybe you could share your first memory or experience with AI. Jeff, over to you. Sure. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm delighted to be here to participate in this discussion. I appreciate the picture on the screen. I think I look a little bit uh, younger and maybe a little bit thinner in that picture. So uh, I'm going to keep that one for a while. Um, you know, I've had the privilege for 16 years to help lead the, the fundraising efforts for, for one of the top hospitals in the world, uh, raising money, you know, in support of our mission to, to help current and future patients. And uh, thinking on your question about my first experience with generative AI, it was probably a little over a year ago. Uh, it was my then high school age son who was using it to teach himself calculus. And uh, when he was telling me about this at first, my first reaction was that, you know, maybe he's he's cheating here. Uh, you know, is this the right way to learn calculus? And then he kind of quickly explained to me that it was it was teaching him calculus uh, easier than his teacher was able to do so. And I thought, wow, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, maybe this is like how I use YouTube videos to teach myself how to fix the garbage disposal when it breaks. Right. But I quickly came to understand as he was walking me through it, that this was something far more uh, powerful than that. And I think it, it up until that point at Cleveland Clinic, we had focused a lot of our efforts on, you know, traditional AI, predictive analytics and uh, process automation, things like that, but quickly understood that we needed to pivot and, and also really dive into generative AI and start learning how that was going to impact our work in, in a really profound way. That's great, Jeff. Thanks for sharing the personal anecdote and, and also the professional application there. Uh, Craig, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And I guess I'll first just say, Jeff, you can absolutely use your picture for several years. I think my picture is seven years old at this point, so it's absolutely something you can do. But uh, Craig Leonard, Executive Director of Pipeline Development and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Michigan. Uh, what that word cloud means is I manage the prospect research team, prospect management team. We're also growing a performance benchmarking team. Uh, so that's also under my purview. And strategic initiatives includes uh, I liaise with our Michigan medicine team and sit on their senior leadership team, uh, specifically to help with the Grateful Patient Program, help integrate that into our, our fundraising efforts for the entire campus. Uh, and I also work very closely with our campaign. We'll be launching a public campaign uh, in two weeks. Uh, so I've been working very closely with the campaign team for about the last three years to plan, develop, uh, and get ready for the campaign, uh, including our, our overall goal and the goals for all 36 of our, our units. Uh, when I think about AI, I actually, I thought about it in both lenses. Uh, traditional AI, uh, I, I was thinking about many years ago, I, my friends talked me into joining some fantasy football and other leagues. Some of these I had knew nothing about the sport, but uh, so I just wanted to hang out and, you know, get together with friends. But I started uh, reading Nate Silver in the 538 website back in the day. He did a lot uh, around sports. Uh, and I was actually able to win a couple of the leagues based on his analysis and some of the stuff that he did, again, in sports that I actually knew nothing about. Uh, and then for, for modern AI, uh, we recently celebrated, my wife and I, our 20th anniversary and our twins graduated from high school. So we thought, well, let's do a, a nice family trip. And we went to uh, Kauai 
And I use chat GPT to help plan the trip, put in our interests, put in, we want to have some relaxation days and it, it spit out a, a great itinerary that we actually used uh, a lot of it. So that's kind of the, the way that I've been able to use traditional and, and modern AI in, in my personal life. So, but again, glad to be here and happy to have the conversation. Terrific. Thank you, Craig. And double congratulations. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Lindsay. Thanks, Greg. So I'm Lindsay Nadeau. I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy Insight at UNICEF USA, which is an international child rights organization. And my Philanthropy Insight team partners with fundraisers on data-driven decision-making. So we're addressing pain points, identifying opportunities, and providing insight to questions that often weigh on nonprofit leadership's mind. Um, my first interaction with, you know, more typical AI was actually Netflix's recommender model. I know it's super cliche, but I didn't even really know what AI was back then, but I absolutely love the idea that I could click a heart or a star rating system and that that would then inform and shape what Netflix offered to me as suggestions. It was a great use of my time and I didn't really know what was behind the hood or how it all worked. Uh, but I, I absolutely remember clocking that as like, this is something really interesting and I need to learn more about it. In terms of more modern generative AI, I do a lot of presentations for you know, the fundraising world. And while I love to write an abstract describing the session, I am not good with session titles, like pithy, catchy ones that will get people's attention. And I remember just dumping my abstract in there and saying, give me 10 options for what a great title could be. And it was done in 30 seconds and it changed my life. And I love having those shortcuts. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Lindsay. Very practical, creative, and fun examples there. Uh, last but not least, David, over to you. Hey, afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm David Ritchie. I'm the assistant vice president for um, at Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health. So we're a 30 plus hospital health system here um, in the Philadelphia Northeast region. I've been here at Jefferson for 10 years and I lead our gift administration, our data quality team, our document management team and our IT and analytics team here at Jefferson. You know, I have the pleasure every day of, you know, working across both the university and the health system. So, you know, get working everyone from physicians on through the professors. And, you know, from an AI perspective, you know, kind of like Lindsay, you know, I remember back, you know, my first time doing some Google searches and the little banner bars on the side starting showing up for my Amazon searches and what I was doing. And I remember thinking, this is a little creepy, but then after, you know, over time now, I kind of love it that they're putting things out there. And then when I think about it today, and I, I know they're doing it, but you know, we have our little Amazon pod and stuff. And as you're talking, you know, you can definitely tell it's listening because all of a sudden you'll go on your phone and it's starting to serve up like, hey, you know, Halloween costumes were your kids' Christmas presents were the shopping list and stuff. So it, it's definitely... Um, you know, it makes you really think about, you know, how things are being used today and it's positive, but also, you know, negative impacts on them being out there and listening at every part of your life. Yeah, thanks for sharing, David. You're right. Uh, is it a tool? Is it an agent? Is it always on? Is it always listening? How does it know? That's a little too convenient that that suggestion is right there. But uh, really appreciate the round of intros and personal anecdotes. Let's dive into our first uh, additional question about, um, you know, building on Ashutosh's summary view of AI and fundraising that CCS recently published, maybe you could all speak a little bit more about the applications and whether they're generative or more traditional uh, AI that you think are most promising for fundraisers. I think each of you in your own way alluded to or implied those applications, but would love to hear uh, direct examples from each of you. And maybe we could go in, in reverse order for this. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, David. Yeah, sure. So so from my side, um, you know, two areas, I, I think for us, and, and, you know, we're trying to um, put both these in place now. One is really around interest identification. So using it, to, you know, whether you're crawling Facebook, you know, um, all of our notes that our major gift officers are, are entering in our systems and just other areas, but just trying to get a sense of what our donors' interests are. So this way we're making a positive outreach, we're sending them articles, we're sending them information that really is hitting the mark for what's interest for them. And I think the other part for us that we're, we're really interested in 
is really facial recognition. I think in time, that's definitely going to be a, a bigger area for helping you come to the web, make sure, you know, as Ashash, you know, kind of put out there, is this person real or not? But just, you know, searching on a name, if you look up David Ritchie, you probably get tens of thousands of hits. So which one is the right David Ritchie? But once you start applying images and layering that in, as you're doing those kind of searches, your rate of hit and success is going to be extremely high. And it really then helps you start identifying this is the right person and then finding out more about them. So, which I think goes back to many of the questions out there around, you know, ethics and everything around, you know, using this technology. That's great, David. And speaks directly to accuracy as well there. Uh, Lindsay, how about you? In terms of generative AI tools, I've had some experience with some that will automate draft emails for outreach. And I think that's a particular area of interest for fundraisers who do a lot of email communication. I helped lead a pilot of that about six to seven years ago at one of my other organizations. And I saw mixed results in the skill and will of some colleagues to adopt the tool. But as generative AI tools become more commonplace, I think many of our frontline colleagues will understand how and when to integrate this kind of automation that gives them a leg up in their daily workflows and helps them work faster through things like discovery work, which is never ending, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's most important to use it there because a prospect manager doesn't yet have an established relationship, rapport, or tone of communication with a prospect. And so it'll help them cover more ground quickly. But separately, something else that I've been thinking about recently with some of my colleagues across cause-based nonprofits, especially at large scale ones, is the burden that our frontline fundraisers face when donors ask them questions about our program scope. Because as much as they speak program and they learn more and more, they're not program experts, right? And so the fundraiser often needs to quickly and accurately answer this donor's questions. And if you have you know, a multi-billion dollar global nonprofit, the amount of collateral that we have is just extensive and no one person can have read it all and ingested it all and know how to find it again and surface the answer. And so if we can use AI to help us answer a donor's question faster and more accurately, I actually think that that will be a better donor experience and will cut down a lot of the you know metaphorical legwork of a fundraiser in order to surface that. Yeah, those are great examples, Lindsay. Thank you. And that whole concept of automation, often there's a tension between automation and authenticity. So to your point, is that best deployed in the discovery phase? That makes a lot of sense. And this other notion of how do you curate content and serve up the right amount at the right time with, with efficiency and, and speed, as you've described. Um, Craig, how are you experiencing this? Any applications you'd like to discuss for a promising future with fundraisers? Yeah, one of the things that we're, we're thinking about is that sort of one stop for, for insights. Uh, I was just talking with our AVP for Michigan Medicine just the other day, and he was planning for a, a trip with one of our top donors. And he was talking to multiple teams, pulling multiple reports to get insights on, on this donor. And we have started to wireframe out something to so that they don't have to do that. They can go to one place to pull the research information, one place to pull the stewardship, one place to pull you know dot, dot, dot information. Uh, but we're also talking about then integrating that with generative AI to pull in mo the most recent news so that even if they requested some information updates from research a couple of days ago, if something happened this morning, the generative AI could pull in that, that news feed so it's, it's top of mind and right there, again, all in one spot so that they, they don't have to worry about that I talk to all the right people that I get that, that you know, comprehensive view, that we're, our, our intent is to create a one-stop for a prospect insight for, for managers, for prospect managers, for leaders, uh, and, and you know, dot, 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 to just, again, help them to go to one place to get all that information uh, that, that they right now are having to go to multiple places. That's great, Craig. Yeah, so this uh, synthesized platform almost that's dynamic, that's real-time, that provides these insights. I love that idea of incorporating real-time news and information as well, because that could shift both capacity and inclination depending on the day-to-day -day or what's occurring in the world, businesses, personal interests. So thank you for sharing that. Jeff, how about you? What are you seeing at Cleveland Clinic? Yeah, I agree with all the other panelists. I think that uh, utility of information, right? That access to information, if you're a gift officer on the road, whether it's you know needing information um, about the, the donor you're meeting with, um, as Lindsay said about the, the programmatic information that you need to be able to, to pull in real time. I mean, so often, in these complex organizations, you're waiting on someone else to come through for you with that information, or it's a step in a process for you to be able to have access to that information more quickly. 
um, that that allows you to, you know, as Lindsay said, have have more dynamic conversations, be able to pull that information, respond more quickly. I think that's so important. And then while you're in that moment, right, you're you you you're you're at a donor meeting, coming away from that donor meeting, you know, how great would it be to be able to use a virtual assistant to dictate your notes back into the CRM and have those notes then translate into action for the person who's going to help you follow up. Uh, it's just all of that, I think. The utility of of uh, the information, how quickly it can uh, translate into action, I think that's huge for us. And then, as David said, I think uh, learning more about our donors' interests, and then also uh, a, a promising area for us that we're we're really diving into is relationship mapping. Right? How to how to connect the dots between uh, our prospective donors and and leverage the relationships that exist that we might not know exist, but that AI can help us find. That's great, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, from insights to actions, love the concept of virtual assistance. There's that speed component again, right? Velocity, security and privacy as well, but the speed of how how quickly can we move into action here? Let's uh, let's kick off with another question around how fundraisers can better integrate AI into their strategic planning or daily operations. And Craig, maybe we could start with you and some of the grateful patient programs that you've experienced and helped launch at University of Michigan? Yeah, no. Um, so I, I've talked a little bit about infrastructure and that, you know, as an academic medical center, we have our health side and our campus side all integrated together. So we have a lot of data flowing around, a lot of data in multiple systems. Uh, and so when we think about what can we do with all that, it, it's well beyond, you know, Excel spreadsheets and it's well beyond uh, anything like, like that. So when we really started to re-engineer our, our grateful patient program, uh, one of the first things we looked at is how can we compile this information to not only make the best decisions for our grateful patient program, but also coordinate with our 36 other fundraising units at, at, uh, across campus. So we've talked a lot about interest this, this today. So we needed to think about where's their degree from? Are they interested in other things on campus? And we needed to bring that into to one dashboard. So we, uh, or one set of tools. So we worked with our data science team to first create a data lake where all of this information can flow together. Um, so it's not just stored in Epic, it's not just stored in our CRM, it's all stored in, in one place. Uh, and then we could then use the data lake to create uh, various views and various strategy uh, documents to look at both the campus level and our health system and make decisions on how we wanted to, to engage with, with prospects. Uh, the other thing that we did is um, during COVID, uh, we converted like many to going from in-person lectures and things like that to we started doing topical webinars with our constituents. And so we would have our top doctors present on certain topics. And so we used the interest data that was flowing into the data lake to curate those lists to invite people to the webinar. And then we also fed that interest back into the data lake after the webinar for folks that we didn't know were gonna show up. So we could then again, build that relationship with them, uh, which has continued now after, after COVID, we're continuing that sort of series of talks, uh, but we're also now engaging on that interest data that we captured during that time because we had created that infrastructure, because we had created all these tools to then act on that information as we captured it. It's really fascinating, Craig, this idea of yeah, how do you capture the information? How does it flow into the data lake? How does it go back out in terms of actionable insights? As, as you're describing that, I keep thinking of this notion of uh, a donor segment of one, right? Where it's an N of one. How do you get down to that level? So it's not a million records or 100,000 records or whatever it might be, but hyper tailored and specified according to that donor interest and experience overall. Um, Lindsay, you spoke about this a little bit earlier, but would love to hear a little bit more about the results of uh, the, the applied predictive AI for UNICEF's donor database. Yeah, so we had, you know, a lucky partnership with CCS about a year ago where we were, um, where they helped us build a couple different predictive models to optimize our prospecting and portfolio health. And let me just preface it by saying that my team, I, I kind of view our role as being interpreters of those scores and models. And so we kind of advise the frontline fundraisers on, you know, what all of our different scores are telling us around whether this prospect should or should not be in their portfolio. And so that's kind of the the lens at which our, our frontline staff are interacting with um, the models that CCS created for us. So we're kind of like an intermediary there that helps them understand. But some of the steps we've taken so far is to integrate the predictive models in our proactive prospecting 
And you know, one of the things that CCS did with us before they decided on any models to build was to really sit down and, and talk with us about what our business opportunities are, one of which is and always will be unrestricted funding. So we had them build us a predictive model for unrestricted donors because that is our organizational priority and never won't be. So um, we've been able to focus a lot of our proactive prospecting this year across all of our different streams uh, with that segment in particular. We've also integrated it into our reactive prospecting. So every day we have a daily new lead screen that we run. And, you know, we're not just looking at the predictive model, but we're balancing that with our capacity ratings, our affinity scores, et cetera. And it helps my team make faster, more well-rounded decisions around what prospect goes into portfolio or goes into a pool to be qualified later, right? The relativity of all of these scores. Uh, and then we're also looking at the score again during our quarterly portfolio optimization meetings with each prospect manager. So we'll look and make sure that they have the right balance of high capacity, high affinity um, prospects. And we're using the predictive scores to do that. So uh, in terms of where we're at next, we're on the cusp of going back and looking retrospectively to see how all of the donors that we've prioritized based off the predictive models performed higher? Do we have, um, you know, a higher qualification or conversion rate for those segments? And then, you know, maybe able to come back to CCS and, and share some findings. That would be great. Thanks for sharing, Lindsay. Yeah, and really fascinating with the integration of that data and all really in service to your business goals and the opportunities, to your point, those unrestricted dollars. So focusing methodology and predictive AI around that target. Um, that's excellent. David, maybe you could speak a little bit more about this notion of a faster funnel at Jefferson. We've had a few conversations about it. Really interesting and impactful. Yeah. Um, so, and it was really great hearing Craig talk through, you know, the university fundraising versus grateful patient. <laughs> you know, this is certainly our challenge all the time. And for us, the faster funnel was really a focus on the grateful patient side because something, you know, if, you know, through articles, there's lots of different information out there, you know, especially timeline from a fundraising perspective with somebody who's an alumnus versus the timeline that you have when somebody is a grateful patient, even if you're curing them of cancer and they're not going to get another 20 years of life, it, it's a very short lived moment of thankfulness that they have there. So you really have to kind of strike at the right time. So for us, it was really how, what opportunities we have to identify somebody quicker and then hopefully find out what their interests are so that this way we can get them in front of an MGO as fast as we can. And, you know, with 30 hospitals, hundreds of outpatient centers, you know, we have kind of a volume problem sometimes with, you know, where do we focus this across, you know, our limited resources of our MGOs. So we, we put together with, with some AIs trying to identify what we felt would be somebody's interest based on a whole collateral data and then we would start sending them messages with very focused uh, around the different healthcare interests that we have from a fundraising perspective to see based on what we believe they'd be aligned with and then sending those specific messages out to them with some being text to read, others being videos, and then tracking, you know, what did they click through? How long did they stay on the page? How long did they watch the video? Taking all that information and then through a bunch of algorithms, helping prioritize and then assign out who those prospects were to the MGOs. And we've had some varying success with some, you know, making major gifts right off the bat with others having much more of an annual giving interest. But we've definitely found that, that there's a lot more to learn on our side and kind of like Lindsay, we now need to keep going back and keep looking and re-examining this. Because I think that's one of the biggest things with AI, I think anybody will find is that you have to constantly learn. You have to constantly look to improve what you're doing. It's not a one time forget, set it and forget it. It's definitely something that you have to continually look at and work at. So we're looking at phases two and three now and trying to outline where we think we can make improvements to hopefully hit the mark a little better than we did the first time around. That's great, David. Thanks for sharing. Ashtosh, that goes back to your earlier point about starting now and not necessarily being behind schedule, but it does matter to start now, to start early, to start testing because the process iterates. And the more you test, the more you learn, the more you can improve on this. But just a fascinating example and insight about almost optimal timing, to your point, David, and gleaning insights and preferences and those predictive uh, possibilities for your best donors. 
Jeff, why don't we um, we uh, switch over to you at this point, and we'd love to hear more about your interest in leveraging automated processes. We've talked a little bit about this, but but what do you have in mind with that? Sure. Yeah, you know, it strikes me that uh, everybody on this call, you know, we all come from different organizations that have different missions, but they're all very important missions, right? And and we have an obligation, I think, to uh, to do everything we can to have everyone on our team working at their highest and best use in support of that mission so that we can raise as much money as, as, as possible. And I think process automation leans into that, right? I think a lot of people think about AI and process automation as, oh, it's just uh, taking away jobs. But really what it's doing is it's taking away tasks, low leverage tasks, and it's replacing them with higher leverage tasks, right? So that each of us can work uh, at higher and better use, right? And taking away maybe reactive things and allowing us to be a little bit more proactive. Uh, one, you know, one example of that is, you know, unassignment of prospects, right? It used to be that we would send those requests into somebody who would actually go in and remove somebody from your portfolio. And if you can automate tasks like that, now we can have our researchers working on proactive tasks like lead generation and finding uh, leads and, and getting them in the hands of our gift officers. So it's just one example of many where we've been able to take lower leverage tasks, replace it with a higher leverage task and, and allow us to, um, and again, work at higher and better use that uh, it helps not only fundraising output, but also our, our ROI. Terrific. Excellent, Jeff. And I agree on the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the cost-benefit structure here. We're also fielding questions as they're coming in and encourage everybody to keep submitting those. We may not necessarily get to all of them, but we will capture them and create some follow-up. And it is interesting in the, the chat flow of some of the considerations and concerns, there is some question around uh, data privacy and security, and it's it's interesting because, look, this plays into the notion of ethics and how people are thinking about, well, what is the responsibility as it relates to security, privacy, and other considerations? Uh, how would you assess this in, in your own work, and are there tools and resources that people can utilize any any practical resources or recommendations. Would love to just have a kind of a quick lightning round, uh, maybe in reverse order. Jeff, perhaps we could start with you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think uh, first advice is I, I would I would make sure that each of your organizations develops an AI policy, right? So that you have ground rules. If you don't have a policy in place, if you haven't thought about how to address this with your with your employees, they're going to be using the tools that are out there. They're going to be out there, sort of. Um, you know, sampling and, 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 and trying things. So it really is important to kind of put some of those ground rules in place. And then I think it's very important to have, uh, like you said, our, our, um, the, the donor confidentiality, the, the uh, responsibility we have to protect that. Also, the, the responsibility we have to maintain auth authentic, genuine relationships with our donors and, and keep that personalization. I think it's very important that those things are are, are front and center in that in that policy and in the training that we provide, uh, so that we you know we don't lose that sort of genuine authentic relationship that we that we have as we start to use some of these tools. Great advice, thank you, Jeff. David. Yeah, no, I, I think Jeff said it really well there. Um, and from our side, the only thing I would add to it is you know we have like a governance committee, and it's really well rounded in that we have physicians we have legal on that you know having a larger group with many different purviews across the enterprise because this is way you know you may not be thinking of everything i think is critical and when you are really thinking of going down this path i would highly recommend reaching out to central is you know your central it department you know they're probably already thinking about this they may already have a lot of ground rules or areas set up as well as your legal department, just making sure that you're protected, whether you're working with, you know, PII, PHI, you know, FERPA rules, you know, there's a lot of stuff to take in consideration. So, you know, step, you know, do your best not to go in alone on these kind of things. And then, you know, just understand whatever tools you are looking at, how do those tools track the data? Is it, if you put your data out there, do they now add that to all the data that's going to be everybody else in a query against and it could be exposed. So you really have to understand the different levels and how each one of the tools work from a free one versus one that you're paying for a licensing for. That's great, David. Lindsay and then Craig, anything else to add on this one? I would echo the uh, need for a policy and working through your data governance and your uh, technology approval 
uh, structure for any new requests. But one thing I would add on is, you know, my organization does a lot of you know, strategic planning, operating planning, et cetera. And one thing I've been trying to work with within my team on is our data strategy roadmap. Uh, how are we providing data support and automation to all of the different fundraising teams that we support? And so adding AI and how that factors in and the right dependency resourcing and sequencing uh, for that to be adopted well and ethically, right? And within all of the approval workflows within your organization, I think is another critical resource that fundraising shops should consider. Thank you, Lindsay. Craig? Yeah, I think just the, the, to add to what everybody else has said, I mean, we're in the relationship business. So I think always putting the relationship first and are we, you know, treating our, our donors, are we treating our constituents just like we would want to be treated? And, and that, that involves, you know, like we talked about cross-campus collaboration in terms of developing policies. But I think the other thing is being transparent to both employees and constituents in regards to what your policies and your practices are. That way employees are comfortable with what, what is happening, what systems you're using, how you're using it. So they could explain it to a donor or to a constituent who might have a concern. Uh, our, our AVP in Michigan Medicine has gone back and forth with, with some of our donors where he'll create two letters. He'll use our internal chat GPT to generate a letter and then he'll write his own personal one. And he creates a dialogue to just show how he is still managing the relationship and he's still knowing them himself. So I think that transparency into our processes uh, is good for both donors and employees. Yeah, Craig, thanks so much for sharing that. That was actually another question that came up about to what degree of transparency are we sharing these AI tools and products and platforms with donors, with volunteer leaders specifically? And, and I think you just uh, address and acknowledge that. Any other comments from our panel on that question around how, how much you're sharing with, with your prospective donors and donors about using these technologies? I would encourage uh, you to be transparent, even if it's in the terms and services or fine print with your constituents so that they understand how you're using it and what you're doing with their data. And frankly, it's your opportunity to steward them and reassure them that you're acting ethically and that you've put a lot of thought and intention into it and its values aligned for your organization. Thank you, Lindsay. Really helpful. Um, I am mindful of time. Maybe we can do a quick lightning round, uh, final words of wisdom or, or guidance as it relates to the future of technology, of fundraising, of philanthropy, and how we're thinking about the, the application of AI. So any final words of guidance, and then we might have one or two more questions before we end today's session. Um, Jeff, maybe we can start with you. Sure, I, I would just, I, mean, I think, you know, probably everybody on this call is at a, a different point in their journey, uh, different size organizations, again, different different missions, but um, I, I think the advice would be to, to lean into this, right? I mean, uh, nobody is that far behind yet, but this is going to move quickly, and if you don't lean in and you don't really uh, take, take the time to learn about how this could benefit your work, um, you can get passed up very quickly, right? As an organization, you can get passed up by your peers who are using this uh, tool to benefit their their work. And as an individual, I think we could all get passed up by by those that are uh, using this. It's it's probably the most uh, going to be the most explosive change in the way that we all do our work, probably since the the mid '90s. So I think over the next couple of years, this will all change very rapidly. And if we don't sort of invest the time uh, in sort of training right now, uh, helping our, our teams understand the tools that are available to them and how they can use them, uh, we'll, we'll all get passed up quickly here. That's great, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for the words of encouragement and, and affirmation that we may not be behind yet, but, but we will be if we don't start running into this and investing in it. Um, Craig, final words of guidance. Yeah, I just think these are great tools for no matter what size organization you are. If it's an organization of one, if it's an organization of hundreds, these are tools that any organization can implement. And I think that's really exciting for, for our field and for, for all organizations that the scalability and the access is just uh, untold of than what we've seen in the past. So I think that's really exciting and it's just a great tool that anybody can use or tools that anybody can use. And that's a really great thing for our field. That's great. Thank you, Craig. Lindsay, over to you. I would say start with applications that your or systems that your organization is already using so that the adoption, you know, learning curve and, and likelihood is much higher. So for instance, you know, whether it's Slack or Zoom or Outlook, whatever AI integration they have, start having 
frontline fundraisers leverage that and your own team if you're on the operations side. For instance, my frontline fundraisers spend a lot of their time external facing, right? And when they come back to Slack and they've got 50 unread messages, they don't even know where to start. But Slack has some of those prioritization features built into it so they can get caught up more quickly and not feel as overwhelmed. But in addition to that, I think anything that is not higher level thinking, as I think David had shared earlier, um, focusing on those things that are repetitive and manual and time consuming, as we have finite resources in nonprofits, that's definitely where you want to focus. So, you know, generating first drafts, prioritizing, and even training and documentation. There are AI tools out there that will screen record you as you say, demonstrate how to enter a contact report, and it will then generate step-by-step -step instruction documentation, and your staff don't have to spend their time doing that anymore, and training will improve. So uh, definitely look for those shortcuts where you don't need to be a human to be able to do it. That's the right entry point usually. That's great. Thanks for the reminder, Lindsay, and the focus of, uh, of application. David? Yeah, I mean, everybody else said it really well, so I, I'm trying not to try to avoid repeating, but you know, I know Lindsay was talking about people and I would certainly say that this, I think is an opportunity for professional growth for many in this area. So I, I think, you know, as staff struggle, like what tools, what things can I learn? I, I think this is a fantastic opportunity for people to really develop skills. And with that development of skills that only help the organization grow and be, become more effective and more efficient with the use of these tools. And I, I would certainly say, you know, as everybody said, you know, it's a time, to bring this ahead for everybody and just start small. And probably one of the biggest things behind the scenes is your data, is you know having that aligned and just focusing there because data is what's gonna drive AI because that's what it's running on. So that is probably the key to your success is making sure that you have well-structured data behind the scenes to make all this run. So this way you are successful out of the gate. It's really great, David. Thank you. And I'm actually going to build on that final comment. And then, Ashi, we want to make sure we get you involved in this conversation as well about final words of wisdom and, and guidance of where we all go from here. But David, to your last point, and this is probably the third question or so we're responding to real time from our audience today. And uh, we have or have had a, at one point as many as nine or a thousand plus participants. But you now the question came up about AI does a pretty good job on summarizing information, but what are the most important data elements to gather? Because to your point, David, right, it's it's you know it's all running on data, and what's the data architecture and the integration? But uh, when we think through that model of crawl, walk, run, and eventually fly, what are the most important data elements? So maybe you'd like to comment on that, and then of course Lindsay, Craig, and Jeff would be great too. So I think it kind of comes back to focus. Like, you know, are you looking at prospect data? Are you looking to, you know, as Jeff pointed out, you know, lots of opportunity for improving um, processes along the way. So I think you just want to, whatever you area you believe you want to focus in on, make sure that that data, because I know all the time in our data, we look, there's never not an opportunity to better clean up our data, improve our data and stuff. So if you're trying to tackle it all, you'll never get done. So just, align what your goal is and make sure that data around that area is well suited for that. That's great advice. Other opinions on that one? I would agree with David. I, mean, I think it starts with like understanding what are those pain points and in, in also the areas of opportunity. So as you, you know, talk to the, the individuals doing the work throughout your organization, where, where are those areas where um, it, it constantly comes up where it's it's either a pain point and slows the process down, or it's something that uh, is 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 an opportunity that would help us raise more money. And and how do we, uh, to David's point, capture that data so that we can then you know going back to the point of putting information in the hands of your end users, right? Allowing them to have that that fast access and utility of information so that they're not always waiting on others to, to provide that information for them, but they can go out on their own and kind of puts control in, in their hands. But it first starts by listening to them, what they need, capturing that data, and then turning it back to them in a useful way. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Ashu, over to you. Other, other thoughts, words of wisdom? Yeah, I would summarize what Jeff, David, Craig, and Lindsay have said, which two thoughts, really. One is, 
thinking about simplicity, uh, applying the outcomes razor, that sometimes simple solutions are actually really good. Sometimes if you're working with, say, wood, sometimes a hacksaw can do the job. Sometimes a circular saw can do the job. But sometimes you just need a hacksaw. You don't need a circular saw. So thinking about which tool to use and what the objectives are, and which is linked to the second point, which is the, the amount of information we have, the amount of opportunities we have can just seem overwhelming. And sometimes what that leads to is we try to find a problem rather than trying to uh, think about the problem. We try to see, okay, we have these tools, where should I apply them? That's a reverse way of thinking. And I would encourage everybody to think about what are the problems that I want to solve and then think about the solutions that are appropriate for those problems. So simplicity and thinking about the problems rather than the tools themselves. That's great, Ashi. Thank you. Yeah, always have the goal in mind, the business purpose, and working backwards to a degree. And I love that emphasis on simplicity because oftentimes it can feel chaotic or get confusing in a world that in some ways is inundated with information. And how do you glean it and how do you lift up true insight so it's action oriented? I am mindful of time. Uh, I'm not going to float another question because then there's a risk of going over a minute or two. And I think our audience would appreciate if they have one or two minutes back in terms of a theme for efficiency and effectiveness. But we are so grateful for everyone's time today. We will also be responding to any questions that we didn't get to separately. Uh, additionally, there will be a follow up of today's recording and you can see the QR code here as well. You can download the paper. We would love for you to be interactive with it. Always looking for feedback ourselves at CCS and to learn. We really pride ourselves as a company in terms of our strategic advice and our fundraising management and learning with you all and really having an impact in the local, national, and global communities uh, more, more positively in this world. So uh, again, I wanna thank our esteemed panel of uh, Lindsay, David, Jeff, and Craig. Ashutosh, thank you again for your summary view and for your insights. And thanks to all of our participants today. Thank you.